All right, good evening, guys. It is six o'clock. Let us begin. All right, I have chapter 31 up. <clears throat> chapter 31 all the way to chapter 37 are all perfusion problems, meaning the concept is the same. All of these patients have either a heart disease or a uh, vascular disease. Uh, vascular disease will include coronary artery diseases. So if we run down the seven chapters, 31 is the assessment. How you study chapter 31 is this is the basis for all the chapters. There are some entries in chapter 31 which will not be explained in the next chapters, meaning there are basic terms here, concepts that need to be understood because they will not explain it in chapter 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, or 37 anymore. Meaning unless you understand it in chapter 31, you'll have some difficulty understanding the next chapters. So we'll have uh, 31 and then uh, today uh, I'll introduce the concepts and then depending on how it goes, if we can finish uh, 32, 33, 34 or wherever we can go tonight. I doubt if we'll get um, so much done. Okay, uh, but like I said um, earlier, because your exam will be in two weeks, uh, over the, these next few days, and I hope to finish by the weekend, I will post all the lectures, recorded lectures on Blackboard um, for you to review. Uh, any question before we begin? I have a question. Okay. Yes. This is BB. Um, do you give a blueprint for your exam? Uh, yes, I can uh, send a blueprint. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. I'll send the blueprint also along with the lectures. That way you, you, you know what to study. Thank you, Professor. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, this is Karen. Um, we, there are a couple of us that weren't in your lab. Uh -huh. um, so we are not privy to everything that was stated during the lab. So. Okay. If you don't mind, you mentioned about the test being in two weeks. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if there was any other important announcement that was made during the lab hours, if you don't mind repeating it for those that were not, were present in a different lab. Oh, that's, that's fine because uh, like I sh also said during the first um, session, I'm going to record IV therapy uh, skills lab as well and include that on the recorded uh, sessions. Did I answer your question, Karen? Okay, I guess we'll go at, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry if I'm not familiar with the rest yet. I'll get to know you guys. Um, it's okay. All right. Okay. Perfusion is what, in your own words, Miss Karen? What does perfusion mean? The, well, as it relates to cardiac? Well, perfusion is a concept. It's an idea. So why does the chapter okay. say, I mean, the unit say perfusion problems? So what is perfusion? So the and ability what is it under oxygenation, because oxygenation is divided into a gas exchange, and then there's also oxygen transport, right? Yeah. All right. So what's the relationship? What is perfusion versus oxygenation? 
why does this refer to the cardiovascular system and uh, actually uh, to the cardiopulmonary system? Why is perfusion related to that? So perfusion is a passageway, in my own words, correct? Um, it's a passageway of blood. And as it relates to oxygen, um, the blood is responsible for um, giving the body life. And without proper perfusion or passage uh, towards the body, then the body would suffer in some way. So adding oxygen to that, oxygen is a component that's necessary for the blood to properly circulate. And if you have any problems with oxygen going to the blood, then it would affect the entire system. Okay, maybe you meant to say blood carries oxygen, right? Correct. Okay, all right. So therefore, the pulmonary and the cardiovascular system work together in order to accomplish perfusion. There are therefore two types of oxygenation here. I mean, two parts of it. The first part is where gas exchange occurs at the alveolar capillary membrane, correct? So um, oxygen is exchanged for CO2. We know the story, but it doesn't end there because the lungs aren't the only consumer of oxygen. It has to be distributed to the rest of the body. So that's where the cardiovascular system comes in. So after gas is ex exchanged at the pulmonary system, so we call that external respiration or external oxygenation. Next comes the internal oxygenation. That oxygen must be delivered to the rest of the tissues. So this is where perfusion comes in. There are three elements, therefore, of perfusion. In order to accomplish that oxygen delivery to the tissues, you must have these three elements. You can see my whiteboard, right? Yes. Okay, so we have the pump. That obviously is the heart. We need sufficient blood volume and we need vessels that can either constrict or dilate in response to the body's needs. These are the three things that could go wrong in perfusion, meaning uh, as you go through the chapters, you'll see easily that in chapter 33, which is uh, acute coronary syndrome, and then you have chapter 34, which is now heart failure, those are obviously pump problems. And then as we go to um, 37, and whichever chapter hypertension is, those are vessel problems. And then we also have uh, dysrhythmias, which are electrical conduction problems. Okay, So if you have a breakdown in any of these three elements, then what happens to perfusion? So let's say you have a heart attack, or you have an electrical conduction problem, meaning you have the dysrhythmia. You have a blood volume problem. Either you have, you don't have enough blood volume or you have too much blood volume. And then third, what if your blood vessels constrict or what if they dilate? Will there be changes to the perfusion? Okay, this may not make any sense right now. Okay, let's go to uh, the chapter. Um, and I'll go back to the elements shortly. Everybody knows the direction of blood flow through the heart, correct? Yes. You have arrows yes. here. Okay, yes. so please review how uh, blood flows. Do you see more than one direction of blood? Of blood? Let's yes. say I'm, I am a blood clot. If I came from the left leg, when I enter and leave the heart to go to the lungs and then enter the heart again and then go out through the aorta, 
Is there different directions for me to go? Yes. Okay, whoever said yes, what are those several directions? Direction meaning uh, a way, okay? Let's say. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. So on the aortic arch where the aorta actually curves, there's three uh -huh. vessels, three arteries that um, bifurcate. And they all lead to different oh. systems of the body. Oh, okay, I, I, I see what you what you mean. No, my question was, when I enter and leave the heart, is there different directions? Meaning, once I enter the heart, can I go, if I change my mind, can I go another way? No, it all flows one way. It goes from the left ventricle to the atrium. It all has one direction, unless there's an abnormal where it does escape through the septum. Okay, very good. So that's the answer. There is a unidirectional flow of blood into and out of the heart. Blood should flow one way. It can't, there can't be a, um, if let's say the heart decides, oh, uh, let me change the direction of blood flow. Let's go this way instead of this way. All right, so there should be only one direction. So look at the arrows. Blood enters the heart via the two great vessels, the superior and the inferior vena cava, entering the right ventricle, uh, right atrium through the tricuspid valve, which is a one-way door. Uh, do valves open and close in two directions? Uh, can you clarify the question? I mean, the mitral and the tricuspid open and close at the same time. Yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, are, do they open and close in two directions? One direction. No. One direction only. So they open and they close. That's it. And so the blood is now in the right ventricle, and then it goes through another door, this time the pulmonic valve and goes into the lungs via two pulmonary arteries, left and right, going to their respective lungs. Both get oxygen, blood gets oxygen there, and then return to the heart via the pulmonary veins. So the only veins carrying oxygenated blood, whereas the pulmonary arteries are the only arteries carrying deoxygenated blood. So upon their return to the left side, they enter the right, uh, left atrium, and through the mitral or the bicuspid valve, entering the left ventricle, and then finally through the last door, which is the aortic valve, and into uh, different destinations this time. All right. This will come in handy later when we, when we cover valvular disorders, namely stenosis and regurgitation um, valvular uh, problems. Heart valves, as you agreed with me, close and open in one direction, correct? Yeah. So if a valve either does not open completely or does not close completely, will you have a problem? Yep. Yeah. Will you, will you still have one direction of blood flow if that happens? If mm, either no. one or more valves do not open completely or they do not close completely, will the one direction of blood flow be maintained? No. No. So that's when you have congestion occurring now. When congestion occurs, of course, there's traffic, pressure builds up inside the heart, heart failure will develop. So that's one cause of heart failure, valvular disorders. Doesn't really matter if it's if the problem if is stenosis, which is a failure to open completely, or if it's regurgitation, which is failure to close completely. Either way, both problems cause congestion and therefore causes heart failure. Now take note that coronary circulation is separate based on the structure of your heart and the vessels. When does the heart really 
perfuse, meaning when does the heart muscle itself receive blood flow? After you're now on figure 31-3. So when do these coronary arteries fill with blood? It After fills on the distale. During what? Um, uh, distale. Diastole, very good. So the heart muscles itself does not receive blood during systole because look at where the coronary vessels arise. They arise from the aorta, from the base of the aorta. So if they're going down toward the heart, whereas the, when the left ventricle contracts, it pumps blood upward into the carotid arteries and uh, everywhere else. During diastole, when the left ventricle relaxes, blood falls back onto the aorta and then the coronary arteries uh, perfuse or fill with blood. With me so far? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, chapter 31 also talks about the the pacemakers, which will now make sense when we cover this rhythmus. Okay, so we have three pacemakers as illustrated here, colored green, yellow, and red. The primary, primary pacemaker is your SA node. And look at the branches. Although it's situated in the right atrium, it does have interatrial arms or branches that cover or extend through both atria. So they have connections between the right and the left atria. So when the electrical impulse is generated, both atria will contract. The second or the secondary pacemaker is the AB node, uh, illustrated here in yellow, sits between the atria and the ventricles. The purpose of the AB node is to delay impulse transmission. That way, um, the atria and the ventricles will contract separately. Um, you can call the AB node as a, a buffer or like a, um, a stopper so that the electrical impulse, once it travels across the atria, because it's an electrical impulse. You know, have you seen lightning stop and then stop for coffee before it hit, it hit something? No. No. Uh, as soon as you see lightning form in the sky and then you see it, the next thing you know, it already hit something in, in the ocean or, or somewhere, right? So the AB node um, is special because it holds on to the electrical impulse. It does not transmit it down to the left and right bundle branches Okay, it delays it for uh, exactly 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds before it transmits it down. So it, it allows, therefore, blood to leave the atria, enter the ventricles before the ventricles contract. Okay. We'll, more, we'll have more of that when we go to this witness, when, when, we, when we talk about uh, problems related to electrical conduction. Um, ECG we'll discuss in um, chapter 35. Um, output, this is your formula. It's calculated by your heart rate times your stroke volume. It, it will vary depending on the condition of your heart and also your blood volume. Let's discuss two terms here. We have preload and afterload. Can somebody please um, read this? Uh, let's review this. This was discussed under A&P, if you still remember. Uh, this is one of the terms that need to be understood because in the next following chapters, they will no longer explain what preload and afterload is. They will just use the terms and assume that you understand what they mean. Um, thank you for reading, Miss um, Pryor. 
read this highlighted section, please. Okay. Um, the volume of blood in the ventricles at the end of diastole before the next contraction is called preload. Preload determines the amount of stretch placed on myocardial fibers. Preload can be increased by a number of conditions such as hypertension, aortic valve disease, and hypervolemia. Okay. So back here on the three elements of perfusion, to which element is preload referring to? Is it re referring to the pump, the volume, or the vessels? This question is for everybody, not just Miss Allison. So based on the definition which um, Ms. Pryor just read, what is preload referring to? Uh, it dies though. Um, as far as the three elements of perfusion, which are the pump, the blood volume, and the blood vessel, which element is oh. it referring to? Blood, blood volume. volume. Okay, volume. very good. It's blood volume. So to put it in simple terms, this is the, because it's load, right? Yeah. So this is the load that the heart must carry before it contracts. So before you, let's put it in a, a bucket of water. So this refers to the amount of water inside the bucket before you pick it up and throw it somewhere or carry it somewhere. All right? Yeah. Now, um, if you relate this to Frank Starling's law, which is um, Frank Starling said uh, about the stretching of the myocardial fibers, right? So if you have a high blood volume or a high preload, how much stretching happens to the ventricle? Wait, Is um... it high or low? Stretch, like if you fill a balloon with water, you play with water balloons in the sun, right? High amount. All right, so uh, how much stretch happens if your blood volume or your preload is high? A lot of stretch. Lot. <laughs> More stretch, all right, obviously, right? So whereas if you fill the balloon with less water, how much stretch happens? Barely any. Normal. Yeah. Or even not enough, right? Okay, so let's uh, relate this further because this is uh, it's describing the force of the contraction, meaning the more you stretch something, the greater the force of contraction. Let's compare this now to a rubber band. The better it is, your, um, your underwear. Okay. Um, you guys imagine your favorite underwear. You just bought it recently. And, no. Yeah, so you, you, you wear it for the first time and then you want to try it out. You know, you, you, you stretch the garter and uh, when you let it go, it snaps back in place, correct? When you uh, go, you know, uh, go somewhere, it's brand new. So will it give you a wedgie? Well, yes. Yes. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's a you know, it's a brand new. It's a good quality underwear. They say it's um, Tommy John or um, Victoria's Secret for women. You know, it, it's it's a nice underwear. So will it, so will it uh, stay in place or will it fall down? It should stay in, stay in place. Right. Stay in place. Stay in place. You, let's say for for adults only so let's say you fool around with your partner when you stretch this like a rubber band and you try to hit your partner with it how far can it can you can you stretch it pretty far yeah pretty far so let's say you're six feet away you you try to hit your partner with it yeah you, you you'll succeed fast forward two years later the same underwear if you do the same thing, can it still do that? No. No. Not at no. all. So it's all stretched law out. Law will work two ways. Although stretching the heart muscles, particularly the ventricles, will result in a greater contraction. If you overstretch it, though, over time, such as if your patient has a high sodium diet, 
and yeah. it will increase the, the preload or increase right, yeah. the blood volume. Yeah. So it will result in overstretching, constant stretching of the heart muscles. Will there be still greater force of contraction at that point? Mm, no. Nope. Not anymore. It's now weakened because it's now very overstretched. Okay, so do we understand preload? Yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah. what will happen to preload if you increase IV fluids? It's actually going to increase. All right. What happens if you, you are dehydrated? Let's say you're either bleeding or having diarrhea and vomiting 16 times in one hour. What happens to your preload? Decreased. It less it decreases. Decreased. All right. So let's relate that to blood pressure. If your preload is high, what happens to your blood pressure? Be high. Increases. What happens? Increases. All right. So what happens to the workload of the heart if your preload is high? Increases. It also increases. Okay. So I can say you guys understand what preload is. So moving forward in the next chapters, when they talk about preload, you understand what they mean. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Let's go now to the other one, which is afterload. Thank you for reading. Zishan, thank you for volunteering, sir. Oh, um, hold on. Give me a second. <clears throat> Afterload is the peripheral resistance against the left, uh, against which the left ventricle must pump. Afterload is affected by the size of the ventricle, wall tension, and arterial blood pressure. If the blood pressure is elevated, the ventricles meet increased resistance to ejection of blood, which increases the work demand. Eventually, this results in ventricular hypertrophy and enlargement of the heart muscle without an increase in cardiac output or the size of the chambers. All right. So this is uh, still this is still resistance, uh, but unlike preload, which is before yes. contraction, this is now when the ventricles are contracting. So how much force are they pumping against? So going Actually, yeah. back to the three elements again of perfusion, what is afterload referring to? The pump. And the, the definition is the resistance against which the heart, particularly the ventricles, will pump against in order to, to um, produce cardiac output. Yeah. So which is, if blood volume is the preload? It's not pump. No, the pump is the heart. Oh, it's it's the vessel. The blood vessels. Okay, this is the afterload right here. Mainly the aorta. Yeah, any vessel. So it begins with the aorta and then so on toward all the <coughs> vessels, particularly the arteries. Okay, it could be central, but more on peripheral arteries. So this is the resistance. So therefore, if this COVID stay at home order continues and we cannot do the usual activities we need to do. Uh, so far in the last four weeks, I have gained already 10 pounds. Uh, <laughs> what happens to my vessels now? <laughs> Okay, so uh, next the workload is workload is increased. Uh, that's it, okay? So we have three blood vessels here, which I cut. I, I, cut, I cut three blood vessels. And I looked at the cross section. A normal blood vessel diameter is like this. This is a normal blood vessel. This one is a dilated blood vessel because vessel walls, vessels are smooth muscles, correct? They can contract and relax. So this is a dilated vessel. And this is a constricted blood vessel wherein the walls 
increased in diameter, in size rather. So this is constriction. It's a very bad handwriting. Bear with me. It's the best I could do. All right. And how much um, blood volume do we typically have, average person will have at any one time? Approximate. We have about five liters of blood. Five liters. different liters. Yeah, five around, let's just say five liters. Okay. All right, so run or circulate five liters in this vessel here. Circulate five liters here. Circulate five liters here. So if this blood vessel here results in a normal blood pressure, which is let's say 110 over 60, what happens to your blood pressure if you circulate it through, um, let's just call these numbers. So that way we can distinguish. So vessel, this is vessel number one, vessel number two, vessel number three. What happens to your blood pressure if you run five liters through vessel number two? You have a lower blood pressure. It will lower blood pressure because what happens mm -hmm. to the resistance? Is there resistance? Dilated. So there's less resistance because it's right. so less a dilation. Resistance, less afterload, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Run the same five liters through vessel number three. Increase your blood pressure? Increase, increase your blood pressure. Okay, so because the, the resistance is higher, correct? So yeah. therefore, mm -hmm. afterload is higher. So it's like drinking bubble tea. So you run out of big straws. You run out of um, large straws. So now you're having to drink Slurpee or bubble tea using a coffee stirrer. So imagine how much pressure you need to suck the, the drink into your mouth. So if, if, you, if that helps the analogy. Let's go to, we already understand the effect of preload or the blood volume on blood pressure. So the higher your preload, the greater your blood pressure. And the same way, afterload. So the higher the afterload, meaning the greater the resistance imposed by the vessels on the pump, the greater the blood pressure uh, and the greater the patient, I mean, the heart's workload. So we understand this concept, right? Mm -hmm. Professor, could you, could you center the, the screen a little bit? I'm not seeing what, um, the, what you have below the blood vessels. Um, say again? I'm not seeing the, 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 the note you made below the blood vessels. So I'm oh, just asking if you could um, bring Oh, okay. So uh, this vessel number one, I put there N0, meaning normal. And then for the vessel number two, I put here, these are dilated vessels. And number three, okay. these are constricted. Okay, okay. All right. Let's go back to the book. Okay, so we got preload, afterload out of the way. So we know vessels are representing preload. Um, mm -hmm. Let's just review briefly the part of a vessel, particularly an artery. There are three layers. We have intima, which is the innermost lining, or this is called also the endothelium. And then we have the media, which is the muscular layer of the vessel. And then we have the externa, or the outermost uh, layer of the vessel. So when we go to coronary artery diseases later, which the number one problem is atherosclerosis, it, there will be plaque formation forming between the intima and the media layer. 
plaque does not is not heart plaque meaning vessel plaque is not the same as the plaque that form on your teeth um, the plaque on your teeth is on the outer surface correct the plaque that forms in your blood vessels are not on the surface of the intima it's between the intima and the media layers okay uh, again we'll discuss that when we get to that chapter but the problem really will be the same therefore when we talk about afterload increasing which is what happens in vessel number three if that plaque or that increased afterload happens to a peripheral artery or that plaque forms on a coronary artery or it occurs on a cerebral artery. In the case of a peripheral artery, this is now chapter 37, which we call peripheral artery disease. You have increased plaque deposits, which is atherosclerosis, causing pain when you walk. If we do that same atherosclerosis, an atherosclerotic plaque forming in the coronary artery, what happens to the patient? What symptom will the patient feel? If there is pain on walking in peripheral artery disease, what will also the patient feel when that forms, that plaque forms on a coronary artery. Shortness of breath, maybe? They will have chest pain, correct? Mm -hmm. And then now, let's form that same plaque, this time put it in a cerebral artery. What will the patient's problem be? A headache? Headache. Something worse than a headache. A Stroke. Now you have decreased blood flow to Stroke. the brain tissue. Okay, they're going to be fainting, syncope? Where the syncope is really a, a cardiac problem. So you'll have a stroke. This one you'll have an MI. And then this one, of course, is PAD, which is now claudication or pain upon walking. But really, you're dealing with the same problem here. The main culprit is atherosclerosis increasing afterload, but the difference is they're occurring in different vessels. So as you can see, each of these problems are different chapters in a book, but they are the same problems, which is atherosclerosis, which is increased afterload. Myocarditis, rheumatic endocarditis, and infectious. Um, those are infectious uh, problems of the heart. Uh, they have, although they will lead to heart failure, but they have a different uh, pathophysiology because they are caused by inflammatory or infectious uh, causes. Right, we'll we'll discuss those separately. All right, let's go back to 31 before we go on a break. It's basically inflam an inflammatory response that's extended long beyond where it's supposed to be, and it actually ends up damaging the heart. All right, so let's go to um, regulation now. Every time there is low cardiac output, there will be autonomic, I mean, automatic response by the body. These are the same uh, responses already discussed under the fluid and electrolyte problems, uh, fluid and electrolyte section, uh, particularly uh, fluids. So whenever you have low blood pressure, low circulating oxygen, low sodium levels, or even low blood sugar, uh, these are all triggers for the autonomic response, the autonomic nervous system. These two are namely the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. 
Okay. In most cases, they are going to help the patient, okay, and maintain um, blood pressure. Um, to explain this further, let me go back to the fluids chapter because it's not very well illustrated there. So here we have autoregulation under uh, cardiac specifically. First is BNP, and this will make sense later when we go to the heart failure chapter. Whenever the heart fails, if you read this part here, uh, thank you, Miss uh, Miss Kema. Nitroretic peptides, including atrial nitroretic peptide, ANP, and B-type nitroretic peptide, BNP, are hormones produced by cardiomyocytes. Sorry, cardiomyocytes, yeah. They're produced in response to increased atrial pressure, increased volume, such as occurs in heart failure and high serum sodium levels. Okay, so uh, it says here that they are natural antagonists to the rats and therefore will suppress aldosterone, renin, um, and all that good stuff. Okay, so to illustrate this, Okay, so to illustrate, let's talk about RAS first. So there are two parts of RAS. So we have the RA and the S. So this is obviously renin angiotensin. So this is the, this will lead to vasoconstriction, correct? Yes. Because we have renin angiotensin and then they meet uh, the angiotensin um, converting enzyme and angiotensin 1 becomes angiotensin 2 which leads to long story short vasoconstriction. The aldosterone system, this is aldosterone so therefore this will, um, there are two um, effects of aldosterone. This will lead to absorption of water and mm -hmm. sodium reabsorption. So as you can see, this one will increase afterload. This one will increase preload. Okay. All right. Now the problem comes if the patient is in heart failure. So let's say the patient suffered a heart attack, an MI. Is this heart still strong? No. Let's say you had a, a left ventricular infarct right here. Mm -hmm. Patient suffered a massive heart attack. So what happens to cardiac output? Decrease. Decrease. It drops because the left ventricle can no longer pump effectively. Mm -hmm. Now cardiac output drops. Will RAS be stimulated or activated? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Now, under normal circumstances, so let's say the main purpose of RAS and the sympathetic nervous system response is to increase cardiac output, right? In this particular situation, what is the effect of this supposedly emergency response in order to maintain cardiac output? Does it help the situation? No. No, it makes it worse because when it constricts, it gets in more. So now, I'm injured, so let's say I got shot. So it's like telling the heart after you shoot it, tell them to, well, get up and then, you know, get back to work because you, you need to maintain cardiac output. You're asking it to pump harder now because the afterload is increased. And likewise, the workload even increases because now you're trying to increase preload. So in, 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 in terms of cardiac diseases, particularly heart failure, of which we have several causes that can lead to it, in fact, chapters 32 up to 35, all, all those conditions lead to heart failure. So therefore, the, the emergency responses in this situation is no help at all. In fact, they are detrimental to perfusion because instead of increasing cardiac output they will decrease cardiac output further mm -hmm. so this one will lead us to the treatment which we have an acronym for actually it's doable um, but let's stop right here do up so that means we're going to give the patient diuretic in order to decrease the preload. We're also, of course, this is a perfusion problem, so the patient gets oxygen. We give the patient ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. That's not, that's, okay. The beta blockers comes in here because the same thing, the same decreased cardiac output which stimulated or activated RAS, the same cardiac output will also activate sympathetic nervous system, which is now your epinephrine plus norepinephrine, leading to increased heart rate and further vasoconstriction, which will increase after load again. So you have two things acting against the heart here. Two supposedly compensatory mechanisms, responses meant to increase cardiac output. But in the case of heart failure, it is not doing so. It is doing the opposite effect. So that's why we add the beta blockers here. And back here, there's actually a natural, uh, you can say, um, a protective mechanism by the heart in the form of B-type natriuretic peptides. So as described here, these are natural antagonists doing the exact opposite effect of the RAS system. So therefore, if the RAS system increases water and sodium reabsorption as well as causes vasoconstriction, if the BNP is an antagonist to this whole system, what are the effects of BNP? Which, as you read, this is released by the myocytes, which is in the ventricles. So the, 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 um, the, con the congestion increases here. There is now blood congestion in the heart because the pump fails as a whole. It's unable to get rid of the blood that is entering it from both directions, from the right and left side. It can't get rid of it. So there's now congestion here. There's now increased preload, plus you have increased afterload. So it's like a uh, self-defense. So the heart will release BNP 
which again, what is the effect? It antagonizes the effect of RAS. It will oh. stop the effects of RAS. So therefore, instead okay, so of absorbing water and sodium, what is the effect of BNP? Vasodilation. Okay, so it will counteract vasodil vasoconstriction by causing vasodilation and instead of reabsorbing water and sodium, what will happen? There will not so get, get rid of it, get rid of it. Right. So that so the patient will have diuresis. So these are the two effects of BNP, diuresis and vasodilation. But obviously, is this enough to save the patient's heart? Therefore, when you're having heart failure, can you just stay home because there's COVID-19? We'd like to stay home anyway. The heart naturally releases BNP anyway. No. 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 However, it's better than nothing, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the BNP release, therefore, since this is specifically in these in this um, situation, meaning it's released during when there is really bad stretching, bad congestion inside the heart, mm -hmm. particularly in the ventricles. So the higher the BNP levels, the worse the patient's heart failure. So we can use the BNP levels to diagnose heart failure. And if it's increased, there is no other condition uh, affecting the heart wherein it is increased, which is, only, which is only in heart failure. So it makes it a very definitive diagnostic tool to, um, to diagnose heart failure. Are you with me so far? Yep. Okay. Um, so this is what yes, I mean professor. By, yeah, this is what I mean by chapter thirty-one has all your uh, foundations for the next chapters. It will help you understand the next chapters if you understand chapter thirty-one. Mm. Are you okay so far? Yes, Any Professor. I have a question. Yes, boss. I know you mentioned the treatments um, and you use the acronym DOABLE. I don't know if you're going back to the acronym. Um, okay. The L and the E. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, we're not done yet. And okay. when we get to heart failure, we will also add the Joxen here in the D. And also in the same uh, heart failure chapter, in fact, we, we start actually in 32, which is hypertension. We have ARBs, which you are familiar with, right? Yeah. We have alpha receptor blockers. And then the, uh, the other B actually is BNP. There is a drug which is made from synthetic BNP. Uh, that drug is Natricor. It's quite expensive, but um, um, some doctors prescribe it. Okay, so it's a, of course, a much better um, form of BNP than the BNP produced by the heart muscles. The L here is not really pharmacologic. It is low sodium diet, which is part of non-pharmacologic therapy. E is exercise. And there will be an S, which is smoking cessation, which we have a lot out there. We still have a lot of smokers, uh, which again, this one contributes to atherosclerosis, increased afterload, increased um, heart failure or um, poor cardiac output. All right, let's take a short break. I'll come back at 10 after 7. Okay, 15 minutes. Cool, cool. Resume. I'll fast forward to 
the diagnostic studies now, particularly cardio-specific biomarkers. This will be very significant when we get to acute coronary syndromes. Um, there are three uh, acute coronary syndromes. We have unstable angina, we have non-STEMI and STEMI. Um, so a myocardial infarction can either be with ST elevation or non-STEMI, uh, non-ST elevation MI. Between troponin and CK, uh, particularly CKMB, troponins are more cardiac specific. Um, there are two subtypes. We have troponins T and I. Both are diagnostic of an MI. Um, they are detected early and uh, they also stay longer. Okay, they don't peak until 10 to 24 hours and you can see them up to two weeks from an MI. Okay, as, as stated here, this is the biomarker of choice for ACS. The problem with ACS is they, um, it's hard to distinguish them because the patient comes in with chest pain, shortness of breath, um, which could be, you know, any of the of the three uh, types of uh, acute coronary syndromes. Therefore, the first action you'll have when the patient walks into the ER with chest pain, the doctor just gives a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome because again, it's hard to tell them apart unless you have an EKG. So the first thing, of course, will, will be to put the EKG on the patient. And depending on the EKG changes, then you can make a diagnosis. So that until then, though, the patient will have a diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome, which again, at this point, uh, initially could be any of the three. It could be unstable angina, it could be non-STEMI, or it could be STEMI. Uh, with me so far? Professor. Yes. I have a question. So, yeah. when yes. you um given the EKG, do you give any medications for it for the moment, or you just have to wait? Well, everybody, chances are, if they call an ambulance, they already received um, aspirin and, and morphine on the bus. Okay. On the, uh, unless they walked into the ER and didn't uh, call an ambulance, then uh, they'll receive uh, nitroglycerin. Mm -hmm. But everybody gets um, aspirin. Right. Right. Just, uh, you know, to uh, make sure it's, uh, we, we cover it just in case it is an MI. So you're covered. We have an antiplatelet drug already on board, which will decrease the likelihood of more clots forming. Any other questions, sir? But we'll discuss all the management and all that when we get to the ACS chapter. Uh, another cardiac biomarker used is CK. Uh, however, there are three types of CK, so for cardiac purposes, we'll, the doctor will only order CKMB. Although this is still uh, specific to the MI um, between CKMB and the troponin, the doctor likely will receive, um, I mean, the injury will likely be manifested um, in the presence of troponin compared to CKMB, okay? Uh, uh, like I said already, a CKMB is still cardiac specific, but it just takes time to rise, okay, compared to uh, troponins T and I, which are um, readily um, going to be released. So at, at the moment of myocardial injury, if it is an MI, the, the heart will already produce uh, troponin. Myoglobin is not very cardiac specific because you can have myoglobin if let's say this patient fell uh, because myoglobin is also released by skeletal muscles. So it's not um, unique to um, cardiac muscles, okay? unlike troponins or CKMB, which is you know, no other muscle in the body produces them. 
with any injury, whether it's a muscle injury or a cardiac injury, uh, in the case of an MI, there will be inflammation, right? When tissues die or are is, become ischemic, meaning they are deprived of blood flow for a certain period of time, there will be inflammation. And we have inflammatory markers, which will uh, be drawn as well, CRP. But um, like uh, myoglobin, this is not specific for an MI. This just tells you how much um, the level of injury is uh, did the heart did the patient sustain on the heart. So the higher the CRP level, then the the bigger the injury. CRP is also used in monitoring infection, uh, specifically if we monitor the patient's response to the antibiotic. So the uh, CRP will be drawn at least once a week to see whether or not the the uh, antibiotics or any other treatment is working against infection because the infection, the higher the infection, then the higher the inflammation because you know inflammation occurs first, right? The inflammatory uh, cytokines are stimulated first and then the immune system particularly the uh, neutrophils or the lymphocytes are then stimulated so you need the inflammatory cytokines first and uh, they naturally cause crp to um, to increase homocysteine is not typically used during the acute episode homocysteine is drawn uh, outpatient meaning to monitor a patient either with known cardiac issues or if we're trying to see if the patient has a higher risk of heart disease. So homocysteine is used for that purpose, but not during an acute episode. Um, I already discussed BNP. Um, again, BNP is the, uh, right here, BNP is the marker of choice for distinguishing between um, cardiac or respiratory dyspnea because a patient with COPD, exacerbation, pulmonary embolism, or having a heart attack look exactly the same. When they present to the ER, they'll be gasping their chest, they'll be uh, complaining of chest pain, shortness of breath, and you have to work fast in order to distinguish what are we dealing with here. Is this a heart issue or is this a um, respiratory issue? So they'll draw uh, a, a, a whole set of uh, blood work. Uh, one of them is BNP. And at the same time, we're also drawing for troponin, CKMB, just to cover everything, okay? To see, is this a heart attack? Is this heart failure? Is, uh, and then we also draw uh, D-dimer, for instance, for uh, clotting, um, for a sign of evidence of clotting. Uh, DN, uh, your D-dimer, then it, it's a PE, okay? And so on. Serum lipids is to uh, manage the patient's coronary uh, artery disease, which is, again, stemming from atherosclerosis. And the number one cause of atherosclerosis is high cholesterol. So this will be um, monitored. Okay, if the, and then the patient, of course, will be prescribed uh, statins in order to decrease the um, atherosclerosis, which is causing the coronary artery disease. And uh, the rest of these I'll leave for you. They're just nice to read. Uh, X-ray, of course, is necessary in order to see uh, also if, if the patient is ha really having a heart failure or if it's something else. Uh, EKG will discuss on the dysrhythmia chapter. I won't do it today. Um, exercise and stress testing can be used inpatient or um, more commonly it's used for uh, outpatient to determine the severity of the patient's heart disease. I already mentioned we'll do uh, ECG separately. These are the tests specifically echo. There are two types of echo. Echo is using ultrasound to form a picture of the heart uh, versus a 2D and a 3D echo. Of course, a 3D is more advanced. Uh, you have better picture. 
in the case of if you want to visualize the heart valves, which I know Zishan mentioned earlier about endocarditis, which damages the heart valves, in order to get a really good picture of the, the heart valves, because it's now inside rather than outside the heart, uh, if it's outside, then you can do with a 2D because you only, let's say it's pericarditis, you want to see the pericardium, then it will be a 2D echo. But if you want a picture of the heart valve, which is um, deeper inside the heart, then it will be done uh, using a transesophageal echo. This is a TEE. This is done in endoscopy. So the preparation is the same as any other patient undergoing an endoscopy, you know, NPO for a certain number of hours, because they'll put the ultrasound probe into the esophagus. That way you're much closer to the heart, giving you a much more vibrant picture of the, of the heart valves. So as mentioned, so this will be essential when you're dealing with endocarditis. Okay. Also, um, for before cardioversion, um, we'll doc talk about cardioversion under dysrhythmias. This is a procedure, uh, an invasive procedure to um, jumpstart the heart. Um, no, it's it's a controlled defibrillation, so to say. That's a general description. Uh, they can't do that though, unless there is really evidence that there's no blood clot because doing so and then there's a blood clot inside the heart it can embol embolize the clot and the patient have um, an MI or a PE uh, I mean uh, a stroke sorry um, so they need to verify first that there is no blood clot present and the only way you can see it is to do a an echo uh, nuclear cardiology, these are now more expensive tests, MAGA scans. Uh, for me, they're um, a waste of money because you can still diagnose heart disease by less, um, no, uh, more uh, cheaper ways to, to do it. Any question? That's about it for 31. I'm about to start 32 now. Any questions? No. No, Professor. All right, so let's leave 31. Let's go now to 32. All right, the chapter begins with the autoregulation again, uh, autonomic regulation, sorry. Uh, we have here the sympathetic nervous system um, and then the RAS system, all contributing to increased blood pressure. So since these are adrenal hormones, specifically um, the sympathetic response, epinephrine and um, norepinephrine, what without looking at the chapter um what are the risk factors for hypertension meaning if constant sympathetic nervous system stimulation leads to increased blood pressure what would be a common risk factor for this meaning you're a stress. person has okay very good stress uh is number one so can you potentially develop hypertension during nursing school? I already yeah. have it. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yes, Professor. Yes. Definitely. Um, Without a doubt. It's probably only if you stay in school too long, then you'll have hypertension. Okay? Mm. Because you're not in school long enough to have. Uh, but um, anyway, the stress doesn't really stop. Uh, especially if you're an um, ad adrenaline junkie and then you decide to work in the ER or the ICU, for instance. So, and so you'll have constant sympathetic nervous system stimulation. So that will um, put you at risk for hypertension. However, that's not the only thing. Uh, still nursing school is part of it. Uh, diet is a contributing factor. 
So high cholesterol diet coupled with less activity, uh, like what we are doing now, like nursing school, you have to study, so you stay at home a lot reading your textbook. So it's like uh, eating drive-thru. Uh, plus you eat drive-thru anyway because of the um, less time you have for school, studying, and family life. So you don't have time to cook. Um, so you can say nursing is like drive-thru material, right? All right, so this part here talks about the RAS, which you, I assume, do you have questions about the RAS system? Because this will be a topic constantly, um, not only in hypertension, in heart disease, in um, heart failure. Uh, this will again be talked about under shock, um, particularly hypovolemic, cardiogenic, and uh, obstructive shock, even an anaphylactic and neurogenic shock, except uh, septic shock. Okay, so uh, RAS will be talked about again and again. Uh, when we talk about burns, you'll talk about RAS again. Any questions about it? Nope. Okay, very good. And then we have endocrine uh, factors as well. So we have particularly um, hyperthyroidism, for instance, which causes uh, increased metabolism, so it will increase your heart rate and increase blood pressure. Other problems uh, which are now under secondary hypertension um, are adrenal disorders, um, which we'll talk about, I guess, in another course. Uh, Kahn syndrome, specifically, which is hyperaldosteronism. Then we have phaochromocytoma. Um, but they should be listed here under primary and secondary hypertension. Uh, please review your um, blood pressure levels. Uh, used to be during my time, um, we, we had blood pressure of 120 over 80, which is normal. Uh, not so anymore. Clearly, you can see on table 32-2, uh, prehypertension begins at 120 over 80. So that's my blood pressure. So I am prehypertensive now. Then we have hypertension stage 1, 140 to 159 systolic, and then uh, over 160. 160 and over is uh, stage 2. So we have two major types of hypertension. We have primary or called also essential or idiopathic. Idiopathic meaning from the root word idio, meaning idiot. We don't know. Okay? We have no idea what the cause is. Secondary, we, we know the cause. Okay? We, can, we can treat the cause and then manage the hypertension. Uh, primary uh, causes of hyper, I mean, uh, primary hypertension are the following. So it's your weight, um, smoking, okay? Um, and sympathomimetic drugs, for instance, okay? Although, no, sympathomimetic uh, drugs like taking Sudafed and all that are secondary, sorry. So these are your causes of primary hypertension. And secondary, you have a long list here. Table 32-3, so this is a very good select all and apply question. Um, cirrhosis because cirrhosis will cause, um, it, it's pretty much you, you cook your liver. Um, have, who has eaten liver here? I mean, cooked liver. Me. Okay, very good. Um, when you cook liver, it becomes stiff, right? Whereas yeah, the, it, long, yeah, the longer right. you cook it, the stiffer it becomes, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in cirrhosis, it's like that. So and, and you have to realize that all the blood coming from your GI tract all the way to your toes, when they return to the heart before they reach the inferior vena cava, they have to pass through the portal circulation, which is the liver circulation. So if the, if the liver is cooked, what happens to the vessels and the circulation there? There will be hypertension. So when you have cirrhosis, you have 
portal hypertension, which will also lead to secondary hypertension. Uh, coarctation of the aorta, uh, definitely this will be under PEDS because this is a, um, uh, a newborn illness. Okay? Um, nobody lives to become an adult unless we fix this. So that's, this is under um, pediatric disorders. So this uh, definitely causes uh, increased afterload. Okay, the, the, there's, the aorta is narrowed, so that will impose a lot of workload on the left ventricle, leading to hypertension. We have drug-induced, um, we have estrogen, no, uh, OCPs, oral contraceptive pills, uh, steroids, um, NSAIDs, so these drugs all cause secondary hypertension. We'll discuss how another time as we encounter them in um, in different chapters. Endocrine disorders already mentioned, thyroid hyperthyroidism and pheochromocytoma, uh, Cushing syndrome, because this is like having really high salt, sugar, and sex hormones. Um, it's really the salt and the sugar hormones. Salt, su salt hormone is the aldosterone, and um, sugar hormone is cortisol, which is the same effect as corticosteroids, so they all contribute to high blood pressure. Um, neurologic disorders, brain tumors, um, quadriplegia, traumatic brain injury, uh, simply because they increase the uh, hormones, uh, particularly the hypothalamic uh, hormone, which is antidiuretic hormone, um, which causes water retention, increased preload, equals hypertension. There's also pregnancy-induced hypertension. Uh, obviously, this is because of the pregnancy. And most people recover after the birth of the child. However, some uh, women with PIH move on to become hypertensive even after the birth, uh, the delivery of the child. Uh, renal disease, obviously, because the kidneys, number one uh, major uh, function is to control uh, blood pressure by regulating electrolytes and fluids. Uh, and then sleep apnea because uh, this thing causes um, uh, pulmonary hypertension, meaning uh, the, the causes of the risk factors for sleep apnea are the same as those of hypertension. Um, sleep apnea, I think, is under upper respiratory uh, lung disorders. Did you guys talk about sleep apnea already? This is an upper respiratory problem. Risk factors are... Uh, obesity, uh, people with a short neck, uh, large uvula, um, adenoid um, uh, tumors or something. Um, sound familiar? No? No, we didn't talk about it. Oh, okay. Anyway, so, so sleep apnea causes pulmonary hypertension. And you know the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs. So if, there, if the afterload in the lungs is now increased, then that will also cause hypertension. Uh, please read these on your own. We already uh, discussed most of them, but you have explanations here on how exactly each of these risk factors lead to hypertension. Okay. Um, as far as lipids, so this will cause, of course, atherosclerosis. Um, that will increase afterload. Uh, some of these will increase preload, like this one, for instance, increase sodium intake, so that increases uh, fluid volume, blood volume, so that increases preload. So um, most of these either affect preload or affects afterload or affects both, okay? So round and round, round and round we go. It's all about preload and afterload, which increases um, blood pressure causes hypertension. The uh, good thing about it is you can also address the same thing since you know increased preload and increased afterload causes hypertension. Then we will therefore, what, what do you think our treatment goals will be? To decrease preload and afterload. Or exactly. Both, yeah. So our interventions will be geared toward decreasing afterload, decreasing preload. Uh, which you can see evidently and very easily in the interventions. Um, 
Okay, this one here is an uh, exp explanation on how preload uh, increases and afterload uh, increases blood pressure. Uh, let's go through this. I'll let you read those. Okay, manifestations. Are there blood pressure, I mean, are there manifestations of hypertension? But what are? What are the signs and symptoms of hypertension? Is there any? Yeah, well, headaches, um, nosebleed, epitaxis, I think. Okay, that's that's partly true. But remember, there are different uh, stages of hypertension. We have pre, and then we have stage one, stage two. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so when you're in the uh, pre-hypertension up to stage one, you typically don't have any symptoms. Look at the first statement here. Hypertension is called a silent killer because the patient walks around without symptoms whatsoever. Symptoms typically appear when there is now severe hypertension. So now the symptoms are fatigue, dizziness, palpitations, angina, and dyspnea. You also have um, pain in the back of the neck, um, some are here, severe headaches, dyspnea, anxiety, and even nosebleeds, right? But again, these things occur typically when you have severe hypertension. So it's either severe hypertension or worse, you're in a hypertensive crisis, All right? So uh, again, if you're at the pre-hypertension or stage one, Typically, these patients don't have any symptoms. So typically, if you have no symptoms, will you seek treatment? No. Will you believe that the drug therapy is necessary? No. That's exactly what my mother-in-law added to this. <laughs> All right. Wow. Complications now. So the longer your hypertension goes without management, exactly because you don't have any symptoms so you're not feeling sick i don't need to take medications these are now the potential consequences so we get target organ damage uh, which can range from a stroke you have pvd because chances are the the risk factors for your hypertension is really atherosclerosis so that will form in any other vessel as well Kidneys will also suffer because the, remember the functional unit of the kidneys are microscopic nephrons. So if you expose those microscopic nephrons to really high blood pressure constantly, of course you'll damage them. Another microcirculation are your eyes. So your eyes, just like your nephrons who have microscopic capillaries supplying them, then you expose these um, fragile organs, these fragile structures against really high blood pressure, then you will damage them. Uh, here's a um, manifestation, table 32-5. So this would be, oh, because, the, 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 because there is no signs and symptoms typically of um, hypertension, there is also no specific test to diagnose it. Does that make sense? Meaning we can't mm -hmm. draw blood and then say, oh, this blood says you have hypertension. No, mm -hmm. there's nothing like that. There's no, you know, there's no blood marker that says, oh, this one's high. That means you have hypertension. What they have, though, is either to rule out secondary hypertension, meaning let's say look at renal, for instance. Or it could also be uh, indicating that you already have target organ damage, meaning we, we monitor your, um, uh, your kidney um, function, for instance. We draw B and creatinine. If they're high, then that means what, what has hypertension done now to the kidneys? Damage it. Already damaged it. Okay. So these, again, are the... Again, they're not used to uh, diagnose hypertension, but to determine um, what is the, the, the effect now that the hypertension is doing to the rest of your body, particularly the target organs. Um, 
<laughs> diabetes, hypertension, heart disease share the same thing. They have the same risk factors, which are obesity, um, smoking, uh, poor diet, name it. It's, um, it's, it's the same. So it, could it be possible that um, they'll have all of them at the same time? Meaning if you're hypertensive, you probably have uh, coronary artery disease also. You probably have, you're probably obese also. Probably you'll have diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. Chances are, yeah, if you're lucky enough, you'll hit the jackpot, you get all four. In, um, these are the other complications that develop um, due to hypertension. So you have coronary artery disease, and this will eventually lead to heart failure because you have now left ventricular hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, your, your uh, ventricle enlarges, but just like what we talked about earlier about Starling's law, about the, uh, the two-year-old underwear you had, so the more longer you stretched it, the, the heart becomes weaker. Okay, so therefore, when you have hypertrophy, it just means it's, it's larger, but not stronger necessarily. So that will therefore um, uh, weaken uh, in the long run your, uh, your left ventricle. And at that stage, you're already in heart failure. Okay, and then here's heart failure. So we'll discuss that in the next chapter in 34. Uh, stroke is another one. Um, that was, again, a different chapter, chapter 56. Uh, PBD, this will be under vascular, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, if we don't have time, I'll just record this. And as already mentioned, it causes damage to your kidneys and retinal damage. But at least nowadays, if you look at literature and also go to the VIDA dialysis centers, most of the patients are, are diabetic. It used to be in the 80s, 70s during my time, hypertension was the number one cause of uh, ESKD, meaning people losing their kidneys. It was hypertension. But now it's number two or number three. Number one is now diabetes. And it can lead to blindness. As already mentioned, there is no um, uh, blood test that will um, rule out, I mean, to diagnose hypertension. So this is diagnosed clinically. We have to measure your um, blood pressure. So it's done by um, clinical, um, examination, clinical assessment. We monitor your BP. The problem with the BP monitoring is, do you guys heard about white coat syndrome, right? Yes. What is white coat syndrome? A patient who goes to the doctor's office or a medical facility they, um, they react to it um, in a negative way. So in this case, their pr blood pressure will be high and it will, it will be a false reading. Exactly. So that's exactly. the definition of white coat syndrome. So that can be a problem with diagnosis. What they'll do to rule out white coat syndrome is to send the patient home with an automated blood pressure machine. So it will constantly monitor their blood pressure at home. So where they're relaxed, you know, they're, they're in their own environment, uh, no pressure, they don't see a healthcare, no stress, okay, because they're relaxed at home. Uh, if the readings are consistently high, uh, then they are diagnosed with hypertension because we can't say, let's say if I, if I, my blood pressure right now is 145 over 100, am I hypertensive? Yes. Maybe. Yes. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. It just means though that my blood pressure right now is high. But for me to get a diagnosis of hypertension, it has to be consistently high. 
Okay, because there are different things like stress, for instance, that can increase blood pressure, right? But doesn't mean I'm hypertensive. If you take drugs, let's say let's say you um, uh, you sniff cocaine at a party, does that it, it raises your blood pressure? Does that mean you're hypertensive? No. 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 Okay, so that's what I mean. Uh, diagnosis will have to be done with a series of readings, okay, and not just done on the same day. It has to be on uh, at least three separate visits. Okay? And the blood pressure measurements has to be taken on both arms and uh, at least three times. So here's the white coat syndrome uh, I talked to you about. So to eliminate that as a uh, cause, then this is the ambulatory BP um, that I talked about. So the patient will be uh, diagnosed in this method. So we'll send them home on this machine. And it describes here, please read it on your own. Some of them are advanced. They, they are wireless, meaning they will record the readings and then transmit them wirelessly to the doctor's office. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, non-pharmacologic interventions first. Um, these are the following, weight reduction, DASH, uh, stop smoking, um, moderate alcohol. Okay, it, it says clearly here, stop smoking. However, alcohol, do you need to stop drinking alcohol? No. 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 Okay, so just moderate alcohol intake. All right, so that's one thing good. Um, DASH is not exclusive to um, hypertension. This is also applicable to any cardiovascular disease, so this won't be the last time you'll see DASH. Um, weight reduction, which DASH also helps with that because that will be a diet low in, um, low in sodium, high in fiber, low in um, fat, especially red meat. So this is the dash. Okay. Uh, again, this is a good select all that apply because we need you to teach your patients. So um, dash will definitely be testable. The choices though won't say fruits, vegetables, fat-free, low-fat milk, and milk products. You won't see that. You'll actually see Menu items. I'm sure you know what I mean. You know what I mean, right? Like and, gourmet, spinach, it'll list Yeah, the you'll actually food. see yeah. examples of the fruits and the uh, milk products. All right, that's what I'm trying to say. Like here, for instance, uh, less red meat, um, salt sweets, you know, or um, let's say uh, soda, all right? Sodium restriction has different levels. Uh, this is the, the best, meaning this is the most popular because it's, it's good. 2.3 is good. I mean, th there's still taste in your food. Okay, you can enjoy it. The, the food still tastes good. But look at the really, uh, when the patient's condition is already with um, complications, let's say hypertension, there's already kidney disease. Look at the restriction now, 1.5 grams of, so, of sodium. That's like um, having a slice of pizza, but you divide that for the whole day. Okay, the sodium content on a slice of pizza, that will be distributed to your three meals which of course will uh, pretty much render your food tasteless, okay? Um, however, no despair. We do have um, substitutes. You know, we have... Um, um, Mrs. Paper. Dash. Yeah, Mrs. Dash. Um, definitely no more canned things. Um, you can have frozen vegetables, but not frozen dinners. It's a difference. Uh, frozen dinners are the ready-to-cook things, uh, frozen vegetables, though, they are fast frozen, so uh, there's nothing in it. So, um, frozen vegetables are okay.
and there should be okay here's the uh, cam or complementary and alternative uh, medicine you've heard of omega-3 right and these are fda approved okay so there's evidence already to support these things we have coq10 um, fish oil right so these are and this is part of NPLEX. There's clearly a CAM component in NPLEX, so you need you need to know these. Uh, okay, moderate alcohol. Um, they do specify how much is moderate, though, because when you say moderate, that can be relative. Okay, um, let's say what if moderate for me is uh, a whole keg. All right, let's say you're talking to an Irish patient, so they may have a different idea of uh, moderation. So it has to be specific. So these are the guidelines, okay? That's, yeah. Um, okay, th these are specific, okay? This, this doesn't say, well, unless you're Irish, all right? It doesn't say that. Physical activity, they also specified it at least 30 minutes for about five days a week. And these are other examples, Walk, brisk walking for 30 minutes, two days, or jogging 20 minutes on two other days. Okay, tobacco. Um, okay, let's go to drugs now. We have, uh, again, what are the, the goal because um, causes of hypertension, if you look at the list, they either increase preload or increase afterload or do both. So what is our interventions going to be? To decrease it. Decrease preload, decrease uh -huh. afterload. Which yeah. is what these drugs are doing. You have a list here, table 32-7, complete with your nursing responsibilities. They have a summary here. Um, italicize in bullet, but the these are just telling you the action of the drug. As you can see here, decreases preload. Um, here decreases afterload, and you can go on. All right, so they all either increase, uh, I mean, decrease preload or decrease afterload. Table 32-7 now, this is the, the definitely the testable part. Questions will go, what will be your either your nursing responsibilities when giving them or what will you teach the patient? Okay, especially because these drugs, um, what's the profile of your patient who has hypertension? Um, Gender will be? Male. Mostly, mostly male, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly male. And what age? Middle age, right? 40s, 40s 50s, 60s, and up? 40s, okay. Uh, so what do you think these um, gentlemen uh, do? You know, what is their lifestyle? And because of, look at the, the side effects of these drugs. Is it macho to be going to the bathroom uh, every two hours? No. Is it macho to have erectile, erectile dysfunction, which some of these will do, especially when we go to beta blockers now? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So these are now your responsibilities to educate the patient, uh, specific, uh, specifically when we get to... Uh, where is the... Ace. So we have beta blockers. Okay, here are ACE inhibitors. All right, so uh, because these things cause um, hyperkalemia, because this is a um, consequence when you um, inhibit aldosterone, so therefore 
aldosterone is not released, so sodium is not reabsorbed. It's, it's lost, but you reabsorb potassium. So this thing can cause hyperkalemia. So that's why you say here, should not be used with potassium sparing diuretics because you know the, the result. Patient will have severe hyperkalemia as a result because now you have two drugs causing potassium um, retention okay, or potassium reabsorption. Um, all right, so this will be like a, a cardiac system though. Don't be intimidated. The, 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 the good thing about heart disease questions, cardiac questions is there's not much black and I uh, mean gray areas. They're, they're black and white. The, the, the drugs are specific. So you have side effects, you have nursing responsibilities. Um, there, there's not a lot of gray areas here. Um, as long as you read your textbook, Okay. Um, traditionally, in every cardiac exam I have made and students have taken, it's typically the highest scoring exam exactly for that reason because the questions are straight from the textbook. It's like a, it's like a medical um, program exam. Okay. It's like the same exam doctors take. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, a little bit. Yeah, yeah because um, again, you do have a lot of reading to do, okay, especially on the drugs. But uh, the good thing is the drugs are the same. They're not, chances are, let's say this is chapter 32, right? Hypertension. When we go to heart failure, it's exactly the same set of drugs being used. Maybe add or, or take uh, one or two. Right, let's say digoxin is not given for um, hypertension, okay? But diuretics are given in, in, um, in both heart disease, in uh, heart failure and hypertension. Okay, Professor, so that's what I'm trying to say, yes. Uh, so just to reiterate um, what you said regarding testing for cardiology uh, or mm -hmm. cardiology on an exam, am I hearing that all of the questions are gonna be straightforward? Application. What I'm just trying to say is, in a, if the topic is cardiac, that's why, in my experience, the the, the scores are way higher compared to other exams. Uh, let's say in, um, uh, you remember your endocrine uh, exam, right? On diabetes and um, thyroid and parathyroid. Yes. Because, uh, yeah, the topics can be confusing because they're the exact opposite, and sometimes you mix them up. Yep. Not so in uh, cardiac um, questions because the questions are, there's no black and white. I mean, you know thiazide diuretics do this. You know um, ACE inhibitors do this. Beta blockers do this. So there's a set of, you know, of... of of guidelines you have to follow. So going to um, acute coronary syndrome, for instance, the, there's a um, set uh, guideline set by the uh, American Heart Association that whenever you do this, there's a best practice. You give, you give this drug first and then you give this drug. Uh, before this procedure, you have to do this. You know what I'm saying? There's not much uh, a nurse has you know, gray areas wherein the nurse can, I'll, uh, no, I, I think I'll do this. No, the American Heart Association set the, set the guidelines. Okay. You know what I mean? Yes. Any okay, Professor. Any Professor. Okay, but uh, the, the only downside is there's a lot to read. So if you haven't started yet, it will be a challenge. Okay, so let's say, for instance, this one. Because chances are, although not in hypertension, but uh, in heart disease, when you go to heart failure, we are now combining the drugs. So look at this uh, statement, for instance, under thiazide diuretics, and it will also be the same under loop because they have the same effect. So when taken together, for instance, you take the joxin and you're taking a diuretic, either thiazide or loop diuretic. Since... Um, Thiazide and loop diuretics cause potassium loss. 
so therefore that will loss uh, lead to hypokalemia. Digoxin, when taken at the same time, digoxin cannot enter the cell without potassium. So therefore, the lower your potassium level, what will happen to digoxin? Can they enter the cardiac cells? No, the left side yes. will become... So where will yeah, well. digoxin go? You are at risk for toxicity. Well, exactly. So digoxin will stay in the bloodstream. They can't enter the cell. So that will lead to toxic levels. The same way also, um, I mean, you're at risk for drug toxicity, any drug anyway, when you have um, kidney failure, because the you know, all drugs are excreted by the kidney. So if you have um, kidney failure, uh, of course, you'll have digoxin toxicity also, along with any other drugs. So it's not specific to digoxin. You understand? Yes. Okay, so as long as you know your nursing considerations, so you'll be able to pinpoint the answers. Okay, this is what I'll teach the patient. So this is what I tell the patient to report to the doctor, right? So you know it causes hypotension. Uh, so therefore, what you tell them to do early in the morning before they get up. Rise slowly or sit up slowly. Okay, so these things are standard, right? So it's, and it's the same. It's not really exclusive to... Uh, one particular antihypertensive, meaning all of them decrease uh, blood pressure. So, of course, all of them will, will cause orthostatic hypotension. There are, of course, um, certain differences. So, let's say, uh, where is um, ACE inhibitors again? Um, It was further up. Oh, down. Oh, right here. Okay. So um, here, there's a warning. Aspirin and NSAIDs may de decrease effectiveness. And then here, the um, because of the action of the drug, because they break down bradykinin, it will cause a dry hacking cough. All right. So if the patient develops that, you know, what do they tend to do? I don't like that drug because it causes this dry cough. Non-compliance. Oh, exactly. But it, are they stuck with the one drug though? Do they have to take this particular drug if they're if, if you know if they're, if they're causing all this um, side effects? No, look at the no. list. Are they really stuck to one drug? No. No, there, look at this uh, extensive drug list. So the doctor and the patient talk, um, you know, which, which drug will work best. You know, uh, uh, this one causes this for me. I don't think I can take it. So the, the doctor simply changes it. Okay, so we can change um, uh, drug therapy all the time. So especially those that cause uh, ED, you know, erectile dysfunction, um, Definitely, yeah, I don't want that. Okay, so we'll change. Don't worry, there's there's other choices. Okay, look at all these um, options here. If one doesn't work, we'll try another one. All right. So uh, you have vasodilators included there. Okay, you have nitrates included, causing um, vasodilation, which of course causes uh, decreased afterload. Any question? Okay, look at table 32-8. Is there therefore a hypertensive patient who takes just one drug? No. No, it's always a combination. And it will be a while before they arrived at the correct combination. So through several months or even years, the doctor and the patient will do trial and error, which one works best for them. Okay. Um, you should know the names already. Look at um, ACE inhibitors always end in prills, right? And thiazide diuretics obviously end in sides and ARBs and in artans. 
um, calcium channel blockers. Well, the ones used for um, hypertension at least and in the peens. Okay, so the peens, amlodipine, nicardipine, norm, norm, normodine. Okay, those are ARBs. Um, because the two uh, calcium channel blockers used for dysrhythmias are not used for hypertension. Okay, these are the, only the depenes are used for uh, hypertension. Uh, verapamil and um, deltaism, which are also calcium channel blockers, are indicated for dysrhythmias, which is uh, another chapter. Okay, any questions, guys, so far? All right, very good. Um, okay, here's sexual problems. Um, women may say, oh, that's not a problem, but this is a big deal for, for males, all right? So what do we do again if the patient develops this? Should they just stop it? No, you can switch to another medication. Right, very good. So that's the most important thing. So you establish a relationship with your, you know, a, a therapeutic relationship, okay, with the patient, and then talk about the reasons for non-compliance, because otherwise they won't um, divulge this information. It, it is kind of taboo. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, this is nice to know. I'm not testing resistant hypertension. Um, I will go to hypertensive crisis, which is an emergency, because all um, emergency or life-threatening uh, conditions are testable on the NPLEX, obviously, for obvious reasons. I mean, you're, you're required to know, um, to recognize when they happen so that you can save, uh, because that was emphasized on every Institute of Medicine report which recommended that you know some nurses don't know the signs and symptoms. So that's why they had failure to rescue because they recognize the nurses are there. So nurses have to know those. Okay, so this, is, this may sound uh, elementary, meaning, oh, I can't believe you will um, test this on this. Well, uh, this is on the NPLEX, okay? So this will start with uh, the correct uh, procedure in uh, taking a blood pressure. So this will also be on the exam. Um, the cuff size is not mentioned here specifically. So where will you find the correct blood pressure cuff size? This is not in your um, medical surgical textbook. When did you learn this? You know what size? Uh, first semester. Okay, so which is, what textbook was that? Um, Fundamental. Fundamentals of nursing. So I'll grab Fundamental. that question on this one. There's one question on the size, what should be the correct size of the cuff? And more importantly, what is the effect if you use the wrong size cuff? So what will be the reading? What will it do to your reading? Got it. Well, it's if it's too tight or too small, your reading will be. Your reading will be. You have it right here. So blood pressure measurement. All right. So we do we need to know the 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 size of the cuff? Yes. Yes. Thank you, boss. <laughs> um. Uh, drug alerts, by the way, are all testable. Um, they, the author put them there for a reason. Obviously, either the patient, a patient died because the nurse didn't, um, te uh, didn't teach them that, or a nurse uh, and or a nurse lost their license and went to the um, block N of uh, Rikers Island. You know that there's a um, specific um, jail for nurses? Really? Yeah, we call it Black Rikers. Black what? No, of course not. Of course not. Okay, uh, Sildenafil, which is Viagra, 
uh, it's quite um, common. Uh, you know this, right? I mean, there's commercials on TV that like, uh, do not take Viagra if you're taking nitrates for chest pain. It may cause <laughs> an unsafe drop in blood pressure. Yes. All right. So again, drug alerts exist uh, for a reason. They are therefore uh, testable. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm looking for, okay, um, teaching. Uh, this is under health maintenance. Health, no, um, yeah, uh, health maintenance. So this is um, patient and family. Yeah, okay, here's the heading, patient and caregiver teaching. Um, you have the reading level of at least 12th grade or higher. So I understand you can read this on your own. So please do. I won't read it for you. By the way, if you have specific questions, you can email me anytime or send me a text message. Okay, if it's a, um, if it's, if it can't wait. Okay. No calls, just um, text messages. Oh, uh, my oh, number. Um, my number. It's um, three five two two zero one nine zero eight six. Three five two two zero one nine zero eight six. Text messages only, please. Thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, informatics. We have different devices now, uh, apps that can, uh, technology is um, making life easier, including blood pressure management. Uh, so please read that. This is QSIN, so therefore it, it could be on the NTEX. Again, for, because how long will the patient be on antihypertensive medications here? usually lifelong, right? Because mm -hmm. it's there, uh, unless it's um, secondary hypertension. So yes, uh, secondary hypertension has a cure, meaning if you eliminate the, the cause, the disease causing the, hyper, the uh, hypertension, or you um, eliminate the need for the medications that cause hypertension, then in that case, there's a cure. But for essential or primary hypertension, is there a cure? No. No. So it's lifelong treatment. So they have to understand that. Okay, this is the last topic, hypertensive crisis. The, uh, the concept is the same. So this thing is not exclusive only to Chapter 32. You will see other hypertensive crisis uh, conditions in other chapters, namely uh, during stroke. Uh, stroke, so your, your interventions here and signs and symptoms will be the same. Another is autonomic dysreflexia, which is under the spinal cord injury um, chapter. Um, all these conditions are life-threatening, so um, good thing is they have exactly the same signs and symptoms, exactly the same intervention. That's a good thing. It's, it's the, the only difference is they're, they're caused by different um, etiologies. So this one is from hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension. Uh, the others I mentioned, stroke, obviously that's um, uh, one of the risk factors is still hypertension. Um, the other, the um, autonomic dysreflexia, obviously is from um, the uncontrolled sympathetic impulses after um, a spinal cord injury patient uh, heals. So here are our possible causes of hypertensive crisis and our manifestations. There's no table, which I don't like. Oh, so you're stuck with the paragraph here. These are your manifestations. Um, there should be more. Oh, we, we uh, already looked at them earlier in the chapter, I remember. Uh, up top, you know, there were other signs and symptoms. Okay, and these are obviously the 
consequences. So when the patient's showing the symptoms and you took the blood pressure, it's really high, automatically monitor them for the consequences, which is now lead to a stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, that is, or pulmonary edema, renal failure. Okay, so these are now a part of your assessment. Management. It's now IV because the chances you. are Thank the patient so may be uh, unconscious, so you may not be able to do anything by mouth. So make sure you have a IV access. If not, then start one because the IV, the medications will be given IV. Labetalol is the most effective. Um, these are other drugs. If if labetalol does not cut it meaning the patient doesn't respond to it, then these are your other options. But again, all of them are IV. Any question? I have a question. Yes. Uh, regarding the exam, is there going to be any type of calculation, for example, for me? Um, uh, five, I believe. Um, I think they told me five doses questions. No, and for cardiac, specific to cardiac. So, for instance, mean arterial pressure or um, um, cardiac output or... Um, no. uh, well, under, yes, under heart failure and also under uh, dysrhythmias because they will lead to cardiogenic shock. Mm -hmm. And you need to know those uh, hemodynamic um, numbers. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thanks. Because the basis will not be the blood pressure, but the doctor will order uh, it on the basis of mean arterial pressure now. So yes, you need to know how to calculate it. And Professor, when, when is exam three? Um, I have it for May 6th. Okay. Okay, the May 6th, yeah, like the Wednesday. I uh, know. Okay. Yeah, May, May 6th. Okay, so it's April, yeah, May. May 6th, two weeks from now. Okay, thank Again, you. To help you, I'll, I'll try to get all the lecture recordings for each chapter uh, by, yeah, by next week. So I'll work on them this weekend um so that you're you have advanced you know reading before we come to class plus we, we won't have enough time to discuss all of these in class right um which one would you rather be a live class which chapter specifically or would you like the um, dysrhythmia chapter or the um vascular or Acute coronary syndrome. Mm. I think about it, okay. Uh, but uh, regardless, I'll I'll do uh, recorded lectures. Recorded lectures. Vascular seems the more because it it seems more complicated, professor. So. Vascular, yeah, vascular. Vascular, yeah, vascular. vascular. Yeah. You're talking yeah. about uh, PPE uh, and uh, aneurysm and, uh, and all that, right? Please repeat, repeat your question. Well, vascular disorders. Uh, uh, PAD, um, you know, uh, arterial problems, um, and then we have venous problems, including DVTs also, and aneurysms. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, professor. Okay. All right, whatever. You're the boss. Uh, here's MAP. It's calculated by uh, two times diastolic uh, plus your systolic divided by three. The formula proves to you the importance of the diastolic uh, blood pressure because it look it, it's giving it twice the weight because what happens during diastole again? What happens to the heart? Relaxes. It is perfusing. It's receiving blood flow. Remember, the heart muscles itself uh, perfuse during diastole. So the MAP formula gives you proof that you know, the diastolic pressure is just as important as systolic blood pressure because that's when the heart muscles themselves, your main pump, uh, receive blood flow. 
Um, there's no... Okay, um, let me go back to interventions here. All right. Because they only mention drugs here. I'm looking for the non-pharmacologic. Because chances are you're not walking around with sodium nitroprusside or labetalol in your pocket. So you need to use uh, nursing interventions first because it'll be a couple minutes to get the drug. Professor, the only non-pharmacological interventions is at the end of the chapter, right before the case study. So keep going. And then, One? yeah. Um, okay, all right. So uh, thank you. Here it is. This is what I'm looking for. This chances are when you, let's say you walk in, right? And then assesses that the patient's complaining of the headache. Uh, what else? The dizziness, uh, blurred vision, a nausea. So you check the patient's blood pressure. You you found that it's 240 over 220. What is your first action? What does this highlighted section uh, statement say? Quiet environment. Take the blood pressure after 20. No. Put the patient in a sitting, sitting position. position. Sit them down. Okay, that's your first action. Okay, uh, so sit them down. So if they're standing, when when this episode happened, sit them down. If they're laying down, sit them up. Okay, you should be in a sitting position, which is high Fowler's. All right. So that's your first nursing intervention. And then, so, of course, you can't leave the patient. So yell out and ask for help. Okay, so somebody will uh, have to stay with the patient while you call the doctor or rapid response, whichever is applicable. Then you need orders for uh, the drug therapy and then you'll receive these orders here. Again, the beta lol will be um, most likely your, um, the order that you'll receive. And here's a drug alert there. Okay, so it does, um, here, uh, if, if you're starting it, do not discontinue abruptly because that will cause angina or heart failure. And then after that, if the patient still um, is severely hypertensive, then you'll receive orders for these other drugs here now. All right. Um, any question on hypertensive management, hypertensive crisis management? And lastly here, if it is resolved, the patient um, fortunately will have no consequences, meaning they didn't have a stroke during the process. Um, they, didn't have, uh, they didn't have kidney injury or they didn't go blind after the episode. Um, so you have to identify and eliminate the cause, which are listed here, table 32-13. So let's say a question goes, the patient just um, sustained a hypertensive crisis. What will be included in the nursing care plan? Low sodium. Okay, Low it sodium. will now be your prevention, okay? Or you identify the cause, depending on what triggered the hypertensive crisis, All right? So it could be this, okay? It could be the stimulant drugs that triggered it. Or maybe the patient stopped taking their uh, antihypertensive drugs suddenly. Okay, which is uh, quite common. 
again, the reasons are these are lifelong uh, therapy. So a patient is yes. tired. I'm sick and tired of, of taking that. Or they got sick when you're when you're sick and you can't hold anything down by mouth, then that could be another reason. Let's say you've had a flu, a stomach flu for the past two, three days and you stop taking the all of your oral pills. That's redundant, oral pills. There is no IV pill, right? Stop taking your pills. Any questions, guys? You ready for another chapter or you've had enough for tonight? Well, class ends in a couple of minutes. <laughs> oh, I thought class was until nine. Oh, eight. Professor. Eight. Is the class uh, eight? 30? 840. 840. Oh, 840. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I wasn't aware. Uh, yes, who, who, who had a question? Hello? My question is, um, since we're having our third exam on the 6th, you said? Yes. Of May, um, when do we get our final? Um, still on the finals week. So that would be like the two weeks after. Uh huh. Ooh. All right. Yeah, unfortunately, these are consequences of uh, COVID. Okay, it affects all aspects of life. Um, I'll try to make it as. Um, what's the word? Painless. Is it easy? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and anti-hypertensive yeah you follow the dash diet okay <laughs> um, I'm not a nurse practitioner I can't prescribe uh, medications uh, professor I'm sorry I have a question. Uh, since we have so uh, we have we were supposed to submit uh, concept uh, case study for professor